Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. With me, as always, is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, good afternoon, Rob. Steven, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And uh, again, I always get excited about our guests, but nothing but the best for our listeners. And uh, an old Dell, this is like a mini Dell reunion. And uh, we have Kong Yang with us, who is head geek at SolarWinds, which gives him great power that he can create a title like that. Kong, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Steven. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for having me on. I'm super excited. (laughs) Sure, Kong. And as you're a professional podcaster, probably more than we are, uh, before we jump into the discussions, can you just give us a brief overview about yourself and highlight your podcast as well? We want to make sure other people know where to get more information from you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, A little bit about myself. You know, uh, been in the industry quite a while. Started out in Dell's OCTO. After that, you know, moved on into uh, some customer consulting with still with that Dell. And then I transitioned into the community in evangelism with Dell Tech Center. Uh, Left and joined a startup, Graviton, which got acquired by IBM and eventually made my way to SolarWinds as head geek in there. uh, You can find me on Twitter at Kong Yang and uh, my podcast. You mentioned that um, I'm I'm doing a podcast with uh, Gina Rosenthal and James Honey. It's called Wide World of Tech. It's not your average podcast. We talk sports and tech. <laughs> yeah, and we had Gina on a few weeks ago. With It's not published yet, but for those listening to this, you will have Gina's podcast will be available by then, and we'll make sure we have links to that as well. Perfect. That's going to be fun. Y'all are great. <laughs> so, and, and one of the things that we want to sort of cover through is the the personal side of tech and and how you know you feel like the the people in the process influence some of these emerging trends before we get there right we're all Dell alums Um, you've got a ton of VMware background cloud background Um, and I've been I've been geeking down on your your blog post about like hybrid IT data gravity we've had tips to Dave McCurry one of our previous guests do you know, does it does it feel to you like cloud is sort of settling in, like it's becoming more boring, or is there still exciting churn? What what's what's your pulse on cloud right now? <laughs> I I think if uh, if you go by just uh, like the event fields, then then cloud is is entering its golden age, right? Because and the cloud conference to go by is AWS reInvent. Because I was there when it was a tiny little show that was sold out. And now it's 45,000 plus attendees, you know, multiple properties in, in Vegas. Lots and lots of excitement, lots and lots of dollars in, in, in there. So, so I, I think cloud has reached a point where, where folks have gone through the hype. They've done proof of concepts. They're implementing it into production. And they're asking themselves... You know, um, you know, how can we monetize this in terms of products and solutions? How can we take solutions that are, are quote unquote, frictionless to consume, you know, led by AWS or Microsoft Azure and convert those into something that makes it easier for our end users, customers to consume in there. So I think it's an exciting time for, uh, for folks who are, are uh, you know, getting into cloud and looking at cloud as the next path in their IT career. So, so you use the word frictionless. I, it, do, you, do you think Amazon is frictionless? Is this a relative statement or is it? No, I, I, so yeah, let, let me caveat that because obviously a lot of their services aren't frictionless, but but to me, products that are great, services that are great, you know, aim for frictionless consumption, right? Sure. So their ease of use, ability to scale, all those things where, where I, don't need, I don't need professional services if I want to do a customization off of it. I, I think that the cloud service providers like an AWS, like an Azure, are, are working towards that end, right? So that, because guess who they're competing with in terms of offering services 
to business units and organizations. They're competing with internal IT, right? A lot of times, as well as other vendors in the space. But, but. Well, so, but some of that has been a lack of governance, right? I mean, part of the thing that makes cloud frictionless compared to IT is there's, there's very few governance limits. There's nobody saying no, right? As a matter of fact, just the opposite. They're making it super easy to say yes and consume more of them. Isn't, isn't that, you know, isn't there some reason for the IT friction, right? These pro, pro, you know, we were talking pe people in process. Yeah, completely um, agree. And, and, and you're absolutely right. That, that is, is it hits on uh, why there's been a lot of uh, inertia for IT ops to adopt uh, public cloud, right? That governance piece, that compliance piece, because the folks who've been consuming developers, uh, other business units like your CMO office and stuff who are consuming SaaS and, and so forth, they, they've traditionally left out the rigor and discipline piece, right? Because they've traded the speed and ease of consumption uh, and exposed themselves to, to uh, you know, unbounded governance on cost, security holes, and, and things right. of that nature. Right. I mean, so that means that, you know, developer says, oh, I just want to build new app, go. They create something, they, and then they leave. Who ends up with the sustaining part of this, right? You could basically be trying to sustain applications using a whole bunch of different technologies. Um, Absolutely, in, you know, and and that's you know, uh, Solar Winds does a, an annual IT trends report that that we query our our customer set, right? Okay. On, are you guys going to the cloud? You know, uh, what are challenges with it, right? So, 2017 was a year in which uh, a lot of our customers who who responded back to us said that yes. Cloud is a destination for their applications, for their data. But at the same time, there's some applications and some data that they're going to keep on premises, right? In, in there, but, but they understand that their business units, they have to become partners, right? Because they, they, they're trying to get the best of what cloud service providers have while instilling that rigor and discipline that they've put into place through processes, policies, and so forth with their, uh, through their own internal IT organization. It's definitely a balancing act. So, so could, we, could we end up in a situation where somebody, you know, it's like, oh, our default cloud is Amazon, but you have, we have there's now IT controls and practices and, and you can only use certain technologies because those are the ones our IT department can sustain. And somebody says, ah, I'm just going to go to Google where I don't have these controls and create the next thing in Google just because they, they're, it, it's not a factor of moving to cloud. It's actually a factor of moving away from the control infrastructure. I mean, is that yes. a thing? Yeah, so, so certainly uh, uh, that, that is a possibility, Rob, but, but I, I haven't seen that. What, what I've seen with, with the customer base is, is the open dialogue, right? So 2017, like I said, was a turning point because now IT organizations see that it's inevitable that, that apps are going to go to AWS or Azure, right? So, and they finally have have allocated budget for their their personnel to to get trained up in those technical constructs. So when when you say that, does that mean that they're moving to things that are specific to the you know Amazon or Azure? Like, are there specific technologies that they're consuming, or is it more that they're moving into a cloud model? So so I, I would say say. Um, both because uh, because I, I think that there there is a lot of gray area in those two pieces right because okay. most organizations come out and they they know that they're not going to be a Netflix right sure. or a Facebook because they're they're not at that kind of web scale in, in there but 
they're going to have mobile apps. They're going to have self-service portals. There, there, there are, you know, anything as a service apps and services that they want to proffer to their customer set as well. So, so they, they, they do want to see what that experience of that cloud native piece is and see if they have the, the requisite talent in house or if they have right. to build out those teams to, to, to basically bring to fruition the projects that they have in mind. Right. So example, but they're, but they're, but they're not, they're not necessarily saying, Oh, dynamo DB is this amazing utility that beats, you know, my alternative to use Re uh, Redis. They're, they're, they're saying I'm using Amazon and Amazon's key value store is dynamo DB. I'm assuming, right. It's not a, it's not yeah. exactly this, you know, Amazon's got this huge suite of tools, but none, no one of the tools maybe pulls you in, I guess, unless you look at natural language or AI or something like that. What's, what's the, how are people looking at that from an IT perspective? It, it, it's the whole composite of things, right? It, it's the ability to, to uh, do things like leverage S3 buckets for your image repository, right? Simple, okay. simple uh, image repository that, that you can then use for your .com and then another S3 bucket for your mobile, but then you can leverage services in between. You, you can do leverage AWS Lambda to do resizing. So a simple workflow would be like, okay, if I add a new image into .com's S3 bucket, check to see if it's new. If it's new, then call this, call this function, you know, and, and then resize it and put it into this other S3 bucket for mobile, right? So, so things like that, that that's where, uh, you know, the ease of use, the frictionless consumption comes in because guess what? It allows you to automate that piece instead of having somebody maintain two copies, two data stores of, okay, did somebody just upload new images for new products and things like that? Do I have to resize? Which objects do I have to resize and so forth? you can start to automate it with policies and uh, call other services. Yeah, I, I definitely see that. I mean, for, for Racken's uh, SaaS portal, right, we're all Amazon for that. So we're using Dynamo, Cognito, AW, uh, API Gateway, Lambdas, CloudFront, right? Rather, the whole, this is this stitched together uh, patchwork quilt of services um, that in some ways feels very different than a traditional IT deployment where you would have sort of had an application stack that you put together and manage. Now we're managing, you know, this Patrick Quill of services. It, it seems, it, I mean, I'm managing less, which I love. So, right, we're not building the infrastructure. I'm not, you know, ha having to maintain a lot of those things. So there's a ton of, of benefit, but it also feels, you know, it, it feels very chaotic. I guess. I mean, go ahead. Yeah, so, so uh, it's as you said, because those services change and they change based off of what the, the CSP decides, right? They can change right. the terms. They can change the way that they, you know, they can change the inputs and outputs, right, in, in, into it. So, so that's, that's part of what, um, you know, previous to this podcast, we were talking about you know, how, how change is affecting our industry and our, our customers, you know, there, there's so much change in terms of technology, you know, the people with it and the processes, you know, in terms of volume, velocity and variety in there, it's, it's normalizing that change journey. That's going to be key to, to ultimately being successful, right? Cause you talked oh, yeah. about, having to, to patch all these services together to yeah. provide an end solution into it. What I see is part of the key to normalizing the journey is, is what I like to term as uh, monitoring with discipline, right? It, it's taking okay. the discipline and rigor of, of IT ops and, and applying it in, in this, this DevOps, CI, CD uh, realm that, that we're looking at, which spreads across what we call hybrid IT, right? 
um, in so the break break that down because I mean you're talking about CICD I think it's 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 worth you know sort of stepping back describing CICD and, and why why is it something that you would put front and center for somebody to worry about oh absolutely absolutely so so for for IT IT pros who've been in it a while you know the mindset and the culture has always been a system of record right you had ops and then dev would follow with their requests right you had systems of record crm hrm big systems of that but what is disrupting industries is is being led by applications right mobile apps apps that that empower customers and users to either make decisions, biz, business decisions and, and so forth and move agilely so that they can differentiate their business from competitors. And what that leads into is this, this notion, this concept of continuous integration, continuous delivery, right? Where, where it's no longer enough just to keep the lights on and continue with the status quo, but you, you, you have to be able to, to continually monetize what you're delivering to, to the business unit, and it has to have a positive ROI. But, so, I mean, some of this, you're talking about ROI, continuously, continuously, continuously integrating a system, that means that the developers, every time developers make a change, right, it's flowing through a pipeline, it's getting deployed and, and pushed into the field. It's, it's a, that's a very different model than we had before with these sort of, you know, over the transom developer wrote it, take, you know, goes through QA for a couple of months, it, throw, it goes into, um, you know, into production and then it might not change ever, you know, at all. It becomes a system of record, very stable. Yes. Yeah. It's um, a, the, totally, the way different, that I... totally different outlook, right? There's no, there's system of record is now fluid. From that Absolutely. It, it, it's, it's, it's like living documents, right? It's living tables, living data points, because you, you're breaking apps that were once monoliths, or in some cases, Frankenstein apps, right? Where different developers throughout multiple years have coded their functions, their procedures, their libraries into it. But you have this huge, huge monolith that's just been clustered together and it somehow stays together but it takes months it takes years to to deliver the next release right so what we're seeing is customers are breaking those down into the lowest common denominators and say hey this is what this is a singular function of this piece let's break these into functions and if this becomes a best in class function then you can use this function in other applications too, right? So, so you develop it once, it's a great function, it's stable, it can scale in there, why not use it in a multitude of apps? And, and so... I, I was gonna say, but from my, so CICD makes perfect sense. In, you know, it lets you, developers are changing code and you're, you're pulling code all the way through. But I know from experience, if you're running a pipeline you're picking up all sorts of junk through that pipeline and junk in a, in a, in a, in a loving way. Um, because, because we all know dependency graphs break applications all the time, right? So you see it purpose of the CICD pipeline is not just to take developer code and features and get them into production. Part of it is to make sure that all of your dependency integrations are happening on an ongoing basis. Because if you stop checking code in, and stop running that pipeline, you literally, you know, it doesn't take but two or three days for dependency graphs to change and you not being able to recreate that build infrastructure. Is that a fair, have you, do you see that too? No, Rob, that's absolutely fair. And I love how you frame that because guess what? That's, that's from the uh, vantage of, of developers, right? Coming, coming through that, that piece. And, and our customer set is, is coming in as these IT ops folks, right? Who, who are in, who are at a fork, right? They're, they're looking to embrace the DevOps culture 
and all these new terminologies and, and so forth. And they're asking themselves, do I need to become a developer? Do I need to learn uh, all the procedures and steps that you've mentioned, learn how to code different languages and, and so forth? Or, or can I continue my career even as all these things are coming down, different technologies, different processes and, and so forth, and, and leverage what I have in, in there. And, and what, what we've seen is, is that there's, there's a lot of things that are still core, even within the CI, CD realm, you know? And, and that's why, you know, I, you know when I talk about monitoring as a discipline, that's one of the keys. So the, let, let, let me uh, quickly define what, what I mean by monitoring as a discipline, right? We see it as eight skills, right? So we, we call it the DART and SOAR framework. So DART, you know, discovery, show me what's going on, alert. Tell me when something's about to break, remediate. Fix it, fix it fast. That's what IT ops folks got paid to do, right? Troubleshoot, you know, find the root cause. And then the SOAR framework, you, you have secure, you know, try not to get breached optimize, run more efficiently and effectively, automate, scale. Scale what, what you're, you're doing. And then the last one, report, right? That's, that's probably the most boring piece for IT pros, but, but it's also the fastest path to getting promoted in, in, in there. And, and so with this skill set, you know, you've brought up a lot of constructs that a lot of IT pros, you know, that, that I talk to aren't even looking at because it's, it's not part of their day-to-day -day purview, right? Not part of their day-to-day yeah. -day responsibility. They, they have hotter issues. Uh, I, I totally, and one of the, one of the biggest challenges that we see, so what you described, we've, we've talked about in previous podcasts is site reliability engineering, um, and some of the concerns with that. And one of the challenges that we see for operators is they don't leave enough time, or they're not given enough time, right? If you're bouncing crisis to crisis, well, you just, the, the things you described are luxuries. Um, you have to have a degree of, you know, unscheduled or, you know, uninterrupted time to pay down some technical debt or to build these infrastructures up. Um, if, and if somebody, puts a CICD pipeline where code is flowing constantly through, you're going to have a constant stream of breaks because um, that's the goal, right? A lot of small, small changes, no you know, fewer big ones. But if you treat every pipeline uh, integration issue as a, as a SEV1 crisis, uh, you're, you know, without fixing the fixing root cause, you're in deep trouble. And you know, you're, 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 uh, um, the acronym, the acronym again is, uh, the end of store. The first part was dart. Yeah. So your acronym with dart and soar, uh, those are things that require you to have some, some time, right. To, to and discipline, to make work. Uh, agreed. Um, okay. as it ops professional, these, these are skills that you should be honing anyways. Right. So, so, and, and that's, that's what, that's what we, we trying to impart to, to professionals who are kind of at this crossroad is like, you know, your, your experience and expertise counts for something, but you always have to be learning, right? That, that, that mantra of be the better you, you know, uh, let tomorrow, you know, come, but be the better you than you were the previous day in, in, in there. Uh, because you, you're absolutely right, Rob. The challenges that you just described are the challenges that organizations, you know, that, that I talked through from, you know, G2000 to, to small, medium businesses, they, they run into, because they, they're, they're deciding, you know, um, do I continue with the current personnel that I have in-house, or do I need to, to go out and hire the kind of personnel that, that can help us you know, really get CICD right, right? So I've seen companies in FinTech, you know, um, go through their 100 plus 
IT protein and don't, you know, squeeze it down to, to the teams, right? And then try to add on developers and then grow that SRE piece um, you know, to fill in the gaps and, and so forth. And with those challenges comes opportunity though. So, so I, I think that's, that's, that's where it's an ex such an exciting time to be in our industry because there's so many, there's so many uh, technical solutions out there. There's so many ways to solve the problems that we are encountering in there that, that that's what makes it super exciting. I agree with that. There's a lot of things to figure out. Um, when, when you look at taking that type of pipeline and skill into a cloud environment, um, right? And then, and then and the pipeline is going to protect you from, from change, right? Well, it'll alert you to change <laughs> when it happens so that you can fix it more quickly. Do you, do you see those pipelines being specialized on a per cloud basis? So if, if I build a pipeline that integrates a whole bunch of Amazon stuff together, how much, how much of that work is portable? How much of that learning is portable to Azure or Google or another cloud infrastructure? Yeah, I, I think I think that the basics, the foundations, if you focus on the foundations, that's what's portable. Of course, the semantics, the little nuances, you know, take for example, uh, storage contracts, right? You, you have S3 uh, for AWS, but you got storage blobs for Azure. So, you know, again, normalizing the semantics, normalizing the technology. By the way, the technology piece is the easiest piece because because at least there's uh, documentation of, of what those are engineered or designed or, you know, what the specs are supposed to be uh, on those. I, I think that the, the bigger challenge is, is the people piece because that, that variable is just unpredictable at best. So drill into that a little bit. I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I'm interested to sort of, how do you defend from an, you know, the people side of building a CI/CD pipeline? I, I've never heard anybody talk about that, like the, the political human side of, of building a pipeline. What does that look like? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I, Rob, I, I think folks don't talk about it because it can, it can, uh, it's almost like a political debate. <laughs> it, 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 there you, you, you have, so many emotions associated with it. I mean, if, if you, if we go back to just looking at, you know, your, your first question where you asked me about, you know, how portable is it from AWS to Azure to GCP? <laughs> sure. The, the, the answer is these vendors want to lock you in, right? So, so it, obviously it's not going to be that portable. The, the constructs that you have to mirror. For, for instance, if I'm, I'm designing a three-tier application on AWS and I have leveraged those services in it, I won't be able to hop motion that to Azure anytime soon, right? So my contingency plan would be to, to architect a, a mirror to Azure, right? Well, what AWS does to take care of that is, you know, uh, you know, and similarly Azure as well, right? Is like, hey, if, if you need availability or if you want these things, design them outside of regions, but stay within our family, stay within the AWS family. You don't need to go to Azure and stuff. So this notion of multi-cloud is very, very tough to put into production because it's hard to justify the cost associated with it. Yeah, I agree. Right. I, I don't I don't I don't think people are building multi cloud applications. I think you have multi cloud organizations. Absolutely. Uh, and that and that's an important distinction. Um, and part of your background is Graviton, which which was a uh, I guess still is under IBM's uh, banner, uh, a cloud broker, a yes. cloud broker. Uh, yes. which sort of was chasing this unicorn of uh, single application portability. Um, Absolutely. Tough, tough problem to, but one platform in which you could 
compare clouds, right? Where you right. can uh, broker all the services between the biggest cloud service providers and, and so forth, and then put those into a a basically working template, which you can then deploy with uh, your credentials to AWS or Azure right. or, or and, whatnot. And it would make sense to me. This is where, in some ways, pipelines changed the, the broker conversation because you could entirely take a pipeline where you're doing build infrastructure and run that on one cloud. I'm not sure you want to. And then target a, a different infrastructure. Um, matter of fact, we see this. Um, a fair bit where somebody's um, using cloud to do a CI/CD and test and integrate on, you know, uh, we actually see it from Amazon back into metal infrastructure, um, where they're doing image deployments against the cloud and then and then targeting a different environment. That actually, did you see that too? Is that one of you know, your your neutral territory now with solar winds? The customers trying to do similar things. Yeah, they they. I would say they're, they're, the use case that you just discussed, yes, yeah. um, in that. I, I think uh, the, the other piece, you know, we're talking about pipelines to orchestrate and automate these, these process, right? In, in there, it's, uh, you know, you, you get into this, this piece where, each of those different stages, you know, um, are getting so much scrutiny and challenges from, so the customers I talk to, right, they come out and, and they'll, do, they'll do a pipeline, let's say an AWS code pipeline, right? And they'll, and they'll pick, they'll pick the, the services that they need, you know, they'll have the source deploy, you know, stages for beta testing and then production and, and so forth. And they'll go through it just fine. And then when they open it up, right, from their tiger, smaller tiger teams, they open it up and they'll just get ridiculed and they'll come back and we'll have a discussion. And, and it's like, you know, I had buy-in from, you know, an adjacent leader, but the, their tiger team leader chose, another oh, no. <laughs> in there right and, and, right and, and so so they're they're standing off and what ends up happening is you get a lot of these awkward tuna box where where now leadership is like okay you guys are two tiger teams who have adopted this we love you guys both because you know these two guys are essentially uh equivalents of distinguished engineers right sure and so so now um, for this particular uh, friend, he's in a tuna box, and they're they've given him six months to to see if his pipeline is better than the other, and and uh, so it right. becomes very political in terms of how do you measure what's better, right? How do you quantify? Well, and and then at the end of the day, probably both of them are going to walk away and leave it to somebody else to do the sustaining, and then with a pipeline, the whole darn thing is fragile. Um, yes. And so, you know, a change in, in, in the app, a change in the dependency, a change in the infrastructure you're using, um, and the whole pipeline is going to come crashing down. Somebody has to know how to maintain it, right? It's, a, it's, it's not a house of cards. It's designed to fail fast. Exactly. Which, which it, means your pipelines are always going to have need maintenance. I completely agree. So, yeah. So I think that's the piece that, that uh, the, the leaders on the business side, they, they, don't, they don't get that. They don't, they don't see that. Well, what they want to see is they, they, they want to see more revenue. They want to see more profits. They, they want to see more stuff that they can offer to, to customers, right? And this notion of failing fast in, in there and then picking yourself up, well, they're – there's the human side, you know, again, like I said, people is the biggest equation there because these two distinguished engineers have so much pressure on them in there. The friend that I'm talking to, he's like, I, I think I'm gone before this project ever gets reported out because if, if I don't succeed, if I don't win, I think they're going to fire me. 
and and whoever wins is going to survive whoever lose probably most likely will lose their job in there is it really fair no probably not in there but then the company hasn't thought it through because they can potentially lose both of these guys right who have two different novel solutions to what they're trying to do in there so so i i think that's that human aspect that that people aspect is is uh one thing that a lot of organizations don't factor in because guess what you, you have the option to go out and hire new talent well the talent that you have in else they have the option to leave as well and we see that a lot i've, I've been calling it an sre half-life or an architect <laughs> half-life right where people come in to make a whole bunch of change and the organization resists them and they're like well i, I don't you know if you don't like what I'm doing, I'll go. I, uh, and other people need my need these skills. So you have to figure out how to, you know, accept accept and embrace these changes. It's it's a very big deal. Um, I we need to wrap up. Um, and I, I know I know yeah. Steve, Steve I am the attack in the cloud. I have I have one one phrase to say that for people should do research on based on on what this conversation is. We didn't use it, but we 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 maybe should have. It's just shift left, um, and that would that would have been my next question if we were running out of time. So we'll have to find another chance to talk about the, the whole shift left concept. Absolutely, um, absolutely. So, Kong, but, um, I'll jump in and and thank you for joining us. It's kind of fun. It's been a while since any of all of us chatted together, and uh, we appreciate you obviously joining our podcast. It's not quite the sports podcast that you're doing, which I've been listening to. <laughs> when I listen to yours, I yell into the speakers. You can't hear me because I yell into the speakers with my sports opinions. But I will tell you that we went a little far. I did personally making fun of Gina being from Florida State. So <laughs> hopefully she's not too mad at me. But uh, And then when I even went further and made fun of Michigan and her bosses from Michigan, that was when things kind of blew up. But... Uh, uh -oh. It was nice to have her and do a little sports stuff. And <laughs> so I was very quiet today, so we would stay focused. But uh, Kong, thanks again for our listeners. Kong, well, again, what was that podcast you do so people can go look for it? Wide World of Tech. Wide World of Tech. Yes. Okay. Well, thanks again uh, to both of you and to our listeners. As always, if you have ideas, speakers, topics you're interested in, please let Rob or myself know, and we're happy to follow up. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Jens. Thank you, everybody.